Why, hello there, my beautiful embers. Thank you all so much for your patience. I am back in the studio, and we are just going to rock out and go with it. Welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. For those of you that have never been here before, sit back and relax and enjoy. And if you start loving what you are hearing, please join the family and hit that subscribe button and set your notification bell to all so you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video. Oh yeah, I've got a surprise for all of you. Joining me today during these stories, I have the one and only Godfather to Back to Ashes, Inner Scare Sleep. He will be reading the second story. Please show him some love down in the comments. Without further ado, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Crazy Exes. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I found out that my ex was a registered sex offender. The victim was a young child on probation, considered at high risk to reoffend, and had several court-mandated restrictions and requirements. His dad and stepmother had helped him hide it from me for close to three years. I dumped him immediately and went to no contact, but a friend of mine started dating him. She helped care for her sister's child, who was the same age and gender as my ex's victim. I told her, and she confronted him. He denied it and said that I was a crazy, jealous bitch who couldn't handle being dumped. She accused me of slandering him and trying to ruin his life. This was before the Internet, so I showed her the court documents I had copies of. She dumped him and outed him publicly. He then went on a campaign to trash me to anyone who would listen to his rant. I was crazy, a whore, cheated on him, had STDs, stole from him, physically assaulted him, turned tricks to support a drug habit. You name it, I did it. I'm just glad this happened in the early 90s, or he'd have put it all online, and it would have been a lot harder to put behind me. This is my first time ever posting on Reddit, and I'm not a writer, and I'm writing this on mobile. This is something that happened to me a long time ago, and I am now a much older and wiser woman. I was 20, and I moved from Northwestern England to live and work in London. I had no real experience of relationships. On the outside, I appeared extroverted and quite tough, but on the inside, I had no self-confidence. I looked in the mirror and all I could see was a fat, ugly, aggressive, and unlikable person. I now see that none of that was true, but it meant that I was vulnerable. I met a man, Robert. He was 27 years old. We dated and six months later I moved into his flat. There were loads of red flags which I stupidly ignored until I was living in a nightmare. It started with control and emotional abuse. Now, I grew up in a very rough city in northwestern England, and I could handle myself and had a quick temper. So at the beginning, I gave as good as I got, but it escalated to him cheating on me, physically assaulting me, walking me in the flat, isolating me, mind games, and taking my money. There were too many incidents to write about here, but suffice to stay in that 12-month relationship he terrorized me until I hardly recognized myself. I was desperate to escape, but deep down, I always knew that when I left him, I would be in danger, so I just kept putting it off. One day, he started another fight, but this time, he told me to get out. I didn't need to be told twice. 
I packed my stuff and was gone within 10 minutes. I had no close friends because he would be so vile that nobody stayed around for very long. I rang a girl that I used to work with and begged her to let me stay with her for the night. She gave me her address and she let me stay with her for a month in her flat, which was about a mile away from his flat in Northwest London. This meant I had to use the same tube station to get to work. It started one morning when he was waiting at the tube station. He escalated it from that point onwards. He would be at the tube station waiting for me a couple times a week. He would stand behind me as I got my ticket and would verbally abuse me. He would never shout or draw attention to himself, but he would call me names and threaten me in a low tone of voice that made my stomach heave. I never reacted because I knew that's what he wanted. I foolishly hoped that he would get fed up and just leave me alone. Then he started to show up in the neighborhood around my workplace in West London. I told my manager and colleagues that this was before mobile phones were commonly used. Other than keeping an eye out for him, they couldn't really do much to help me. Sometimes I would see him at a distance standing on a corner or catch a glimpse of him in a local market and then he would vanish. I thought I was going mad or developing paranoia. I moved out of my friend's flat into a shared house about a mile and a half away from him. I don't know any other areas of London and I had made some friends in that area so I didn't want to leave completely. I used the same tube station, and as I stopped seeing him there, I thought he was starting to move on. It took me a couple of weeks to notice the white van with blacked out windows that was permanently parked across the road from my flat. I thought it belonged to a neighbor. I was horrified when I realized it was him, and he would sit in that van day and night watching me and tracking my movements. One day, soon after the van appeared, he approached one of my housemates to give me a message and asked for the telephone number. I wasn't that friendly with my housemates, so I hadn't told them what was going on. They thought that he was a friend and gave him the number. From then on, he rang every night all through the night. Eventually, I told my housemates what was happening, and they promised not to let him and unplugged the phone that night. He started to leave gifts and cards on my doorstep. My room was on the ground floor, and a brick was thrown through my window. I'm phobic about birds and keep finding dead birds on my windowsill. I was a nervous wreck, flinching at shadows and jumping out the slightest sound. I thought about moving again, but I knew he would find me through my workplace. I went to the police, who said because he hadn't actually done anything, then there was nothing they could do. This was before stalking was a criminal offense in the UK. I would come home and find type letters posted through the door asking me why had I been to a certain shop or cafe or theater on a certain day or night. The letters would ask me why I had visited a certain address and who lived there. It was relentless, and I knew that he was letting me know that he was there watching all the time. I wanted to leave London and go back home, but I couldn't tell my family what was happening, as my mother was seriously ill, and I didn't want to worry my dad and my siblings, as they had enough to deal with. In desperation, I decided to pretend that I left London by packing a couple of suitcases and taking them back to my home city. I knew he would be watching me, and I hoped that he would be fooled. I totally underestimated his lunacy. I would stay at my best mate's house when I returned home. I thought I saw him once, but I thought I was just being paranoid. The night after I arrived, I went out for a couple of drinks with my best friend Diane and two other friends, Billy and John. We went to a couple of bars, listened to some music, then all ended up back at her house just drinking and chatting. Billy and John left around 3 a.m. A couple of days later, I returned to London. There was a note waiting for me on the doormat. I opened it, and to my horror, it contained details of my night out. It mentioned John. It named bars where we had drank, and even the name of the band. Then he rang the house phone, screaming and ranting words that made no sense. I saw one of his friends who told me that, unbeknownst to me, the crazy ex had drove 200 miles and gone straight to my best friend's house. He had watched me go out and waited for me to return home from the night out. Then he followed John and waited outside his house too. The following day, when John went to his local pub for a Sunday afternoon drink, my maniac ex followed John in there and made a point of chatting with him to find out his name, etc., this had gone on for about four months at this point. 
about a month later, I was on my way home from work. It was winter, around 7 p.m., and the streets were dark. He grabbed me on a side street, dragged me into the back of the van. I was petrified and crying in the dark, being thrown from side to side. All I could hear was the radio. He hadn't said a word. After about an hour, the van stopped and the back door opened, and I was in an empty car park with trees around it. He kept his hand on the back of my neck as he made me walk for about 20 minutes through what I guessed was a forest. He never said a word as I asked him where we were going and why he was doing this. It was as though he was deaf because he didn't even acknowledge what I was saying. The night was freezing and there were no lights other than his torch. I don't know how many times I fell over and got dragged back up to my feet. Eventually, we reached a sort of clearing and he pulled me behind a tree with a stick and plastic bag tied to it. Then he showed me a shallow rectangular hole in the ground and said that that was my grave and that he would happily go to prison knowing that I was dead because of all the pain that I had caused him. He pulled a short, thin blue rope from his pocket and at that point he looked unrecognizable. His expression was pure darkness and all I could see was his crazy eyes staring right through me. He had his hand on my throat and the rope in his other hand. I swear I have never been so scared in my life. I was shaking with terror. I honestly thought that forest clearing would be the last place I would ever see again in this world. Suddenly, I knew with complete certainty that I had to stay calm if I was going to get out of this alive. I told him he didn't need to do this, that I knew I was wrong to make him mad. It was all my fault and I was sorry. I told him we could get back together and I knew now that he really loved me. In the end, God knows how, but somehow I got through to him, and his eyes cleared and he spoke to me. He agreed to let me go and get my things to move back in with him. He drove me back to my flat and I ran inside and collapsed on the floor while he waited outside. He started beeping his horn, banging on the door, and ranting and raving outside the house. My housemate rang the police, but he left as they arrived in the street. I gave him his details and told them what had happened. He denied everything, and the police said that there was no witnesses, so it was my word against his. The police told me they had warned him, but ultimately they couldn't do anything without proof. I gave them the notes he had left, the van registration, the names of people who could verify what I was saying, but still, they said it wasn't enough to arrest him and charge him. They checked the van registration, but it wasn't registered to his name. And so, the stalking and harassment continued. I started carrying a R alarm, hairspray, a screwdriver, and anything else that I thought might protect me. I hadn't slept properly for weeks, and food stuck in my throat if I tried to eat. I was a shadow of my normal self. Friends of his came to see me, to tell me to leave London, as he was obsessed with revenge because I had been to the police. I went to a solicitor who wrote a cease and desist letter. I found parts of it ripped on my doorstep. About six months from the start of his terror campaign, I was asked out on a date by Gary, who was a friend of my friend's boyfriend, Pete. I was trying to convince myself that I could carry on living with some semblance of normality. I agreed to go out with Gary if Pete came along too. After a few drinks, we went to the club. Pete, who wasn't drinking, said he would give us a lift home. We were in Pete's car, and he started the engine and drove for about five minutes. Then I heard Pete say, there's something wrong with my brakes. Then he said, there's a white van following us. My heart started beating 100 miles per hour, and my throat started to close as I asked him, does the van have the reg number 1234? To my horror, it did. It was him following us. I quickly had to explain to Pete and Gary that I had a lunatic ex-boyfriend who just happened to be stalking me right at that very moment. Pete was only driving at about 20 miles per hour. He pulled the car over, and we jumped out and ran through a housing estate of tenant flats until we lost him. We found a mini cab office, and as I was too scared to go back to my flat, I ended up sleeping on Gary's couch. Unsurprisingly, the potential new relationship ended that night. The next day, Gary rang me to say that he had been back to pick up his car, and the brake cable had been partially cut until it was nearly severed. I truly believe he tried to kill all three of us that night. 
Gary and Pete wanted me to go to the police, but I had lost all faith in them. Every time I had asked the police to help me, they had done nothing. And it just made things worse by reinforcing how powerless I was. Enough was enough. I knew that he wasn't going to stop. I didn't even know what he wanted anymore. That same week, I gave notice on my flat and handed in my notice at work. I booked a six-month air ticket to India. In my crazy mind, I thought, well, it's one of the most populated places on the planet, so he will never find me there. And I traveled around India on my own for six months. I did a lot of thinking and healing and returned to my home city. I never returned to London. And thank God, I never saw him again. She wasn't my girlfriend, but she was my roommate in New York City. She said she was a lesbian, and the rule is, you can't hook up with roommates. So, I thought I was fine. Then, one night, I hooked up with her and her girlfriend, and after this, a screw went loose in her mind. She wanted to hang out all of the time and for me to go with her when she went out. But I had my friends, too, and didn't want to hang out with a group of lesbians all the time. That seems lame. In addition to not going out with her all the time, she started pounding on my door to hook up when I was at the apartment, but I wasn't really interested and it drove her crazy. Well, one day I was on the roof deck of our apartment complex chilling with my neighbor and all of a sudden cops burst through the door and asked for me by name. They cuffed me on the spot and I had no idea why at the time. Later, I found out that my roommate called 911 and stated that I was harassing her and calling her five times a day for two weeks. Phone records would later show I called her zero times in two weeks. When I was arrested, I only had my ID and 10 bucks on me. They didn't let me grab my wallet. So, after about 30 hours in jail and going in front of a judge, I was released and it was 4 a.m. and I was homeless. The judge said I was restricted from going back to my apartment. I was fucked. Really fucked. I was starving as all they gave us were these cheese sandwiches and milk, but I asked for other people's milk as I was hungry. I didn't know a lot of people's addresses off the top of my head, but I knew one friend on 55th Street and decided to make the trek up there. I decided to walk over using the subway. I spent $2 on an orange on the way and had $8 left. It was about 5.30 a.m. I got to 55th Street. I'm hungry and tired and feel completely fucked. He has to be there. I hope the buzzer wakes him up. I say a quick prayer and then buzz his apartment. He answers, yes. He lets me upstairs and I tell him the entire story. He says, bruh, I know what you need, a fat joint. So we lit up and contemplated life. And it was one of the greatest moments of my life escaping being homeless. He let me stay there in this tiny-ass studio until I got my new place. And after that, I started dating this girl in the South, so moved back down there to be with her. But the stupid case in New York City was still going, so I had to fly back to New York City once a month for six months until prosecution accepted the evidence. Every month I would fly there and sit in the courtroom and they would say, prosecution has not accepted the evidence. It was so fucking stupid. All they had to do was check my phone record that I submitted and compare it against the lie she had said. Also, I didn't know it at the time, but there is a New York state law that says if a female ever calls 911 for a domestic issue, the male is automatically arrested and processed. She blatantly perjured herself, and the prosecutors didn't want to press charges. Moral of the story? Don't stick your dick in crazy. You 
think you can control the situation. But when a crazy girl has venom towards you, you're fucked. My roommate also stole $200 from my wallet when I was gone and put all of my paintings on the roof. Luckily, my neighbor took them down and kept them for me. Also, I had to line up a court-appointed time to pick up my stuff from the apartment, and she was 30 minutes late to the court-appointed time, so a bunch of cops and I were just waiting with our thumbs up our asses, and the cops almost left. It was ridiculous. And she never showed up for one court date, yet didn't drop the charges. I recently escaped from a two-plus-year relationship with a sociopathic narcissist. She was borderline crazy and got jealous and often violent when she drank, which was often. Some of the things she did to me poured boiling water over my head while I was sleeping. I spent six days in the burn unit, ICU. Why I went back to her after a while, I have no idea. I certainly shouldn't have. My entire family and best friend even disowned me as long as I stayed with her. Hit me in the head with a baseball bat while I was sleeping. Five stitches. Managed to get banned from virtually every place I lived and both bars I went to. It only took her 20 minutes at one of them and got me evicted from at least two places with her actions took $4,500 out of my bank account while I was in jail, leaving me with $1.35. Didn't even ask why I was stupid enough to add her to my account. Called the police at least eight times, claiming I was beating her. I don't beat women and had never, ever even been accused of it, let alone arrested for it. This has caused me so many problems that I am still dealing with them, including three months in jail. This occurred after I had given her $1,000 to rent an apartment, telling her I would need to stay there for a few days until a big check I was expecting came in. She told me I had to leave at 2 a.m. a couple of nights later. And, as I was leaving, as requested, she called the police to complain that I was harassing her. This combined with a statement and complaint she had made when she had gone to the hospital several months earlier to detox, something she did six or so times during our relationship, that accused me of, in great detail, of beating her and sending her to the hospital, landing me in jail. This is where I finally decided enough is enough and disappeared from her life when I was released. She had emptied my bank account, so no bail for me. As it was $2,500, I would never see again. I ended up pleading to a misdemeanor and waited for sentencing to get out. I wrote a letter to the judge with her written statement and multiple documents. Letter from Cabby who picked her up, hospital intake record with the time, various police statements, etc., showing that her written statement was completely false. Literally, from the opening sentence, I think the judge was the only one that believed me, as she had me released ASAP and dropped all other charges and punishment, except for a short term of probation required by law in the state. Unfortunately, I now have several permanent blots on an otherwise clean record with the added stigma of a DV conviction. She no longer knows my new phone number or where I currently live. I saw her once recently in the library when she sent someone over to tell me she wanted to talk to me. And when I saw her, I picked up and left. The cabbie is a mutual friend of ours and told me she has been going off the deep end with her drinking to the point of several recent evictions, but I won't save her anymore. 
I guess God gives you experiences that you can survive and learn from. This was certainly one of them. That's my story, and I'm glad that it's over. Okay, enough whining. I'm going back to my Android programming. Ah, uh, here's a quick update. So, I saw her twice this year, and both times ended with me in jail when I would not let her stay with me, and she took $2,000 in cash, a $500 marmot down Gore-Tex parka, my keys, and my phone. She showed up at my door the first time at about January 17th, I think, at 3.30 in the morning, with the shit beat out of her by her new man. I am very empathetic, and let her in while I tried to call the police to come to take her to the hospital. She grabbed my phone away and eventually called them myself, and they arrested me and made me leave my door open so she could stay in my apartment. The next time, a few weeks later, she didn't even bother trying to ask me to stay over. A cop just showed up at my door. I had not seen her since the January incident. She had three cop cars in the parking lot as I was being taken out in handcuffs. I watched her demonstrate to them how she had to run out of the back door to get away from me as I was beating her. Again, they made me leave my door open for her. Life is crazy, or else it's just me. Last time I saw her, she was yelling at me from across the street. I just ignored her, as I tried to do a long time ago. You guys, I don't normally comment on stories, but this dude, like, needs to move across town or maybe to a different city. It might even help if he installs cameras. That way he can file for a DVO, and this woman, when she lies, she'll end up in jail. I don't know. Back to our stories. We were high school sweethearts for four years. We broke up in our first year of college to see other people. Him saying he didn't want to be a philanderer and me not wanting to hold on to him from 200 miles away in the fall of 1985. Fast forward to 2012. 27 years later, we found each other on Facebook, and over an amazingly very short amount of time, we decided that we were interested in getting back together and making things permanent with a plan to marry. He immediately found work in my area, quit his job, and moved out of his mother's apartment and into my home that I owned for 14 years, all in a matter of six weeks' time. This should have been red flag number one, but it wasn't. It seemed to me like he was very serious about me and the relationship, making definitive decisions without hesitation as I was him, and all was beautiful and quite well for about three months. Then the nightmare began. One day I was sitting in the car waiting for him to cash his check. He left his phone in the car on the dashboard face up. While waiting, a text message of a woman's body flashed on the screen. It was just brief enough for me to see it was a female barely clothed. My spidey sense told me, You better look deeper, girl. So I picked up the phone and I did. Turns out, to my surprise, he and some woman I didn't know were exchanging texts and... His last one to her was, send me a full body pic. I immediately asked him why he was requesting to see another woman's body when he had mine to enjoy any time he wanted. I am attractive and was not in any way reluctant to please my man at his request. So my question was a very valid one. We argued and I let it go but kept it in my memory bank for future reference. Over the next couple of months, he would openly flirt online with ex-girlfriends who were friends on his page. No respect for me was given, even when I mentioned this bothered me. 
One ex even bold enough to tell him she was getting shivers up and down her spine at the thought of seeing him again when he mentioned he'd be in town visiting his son soon. This continued despite me asking him to put her in check or unfriend the disrespectful ex. He went on that trip and his hotel room phone disconnected mysteriously right in the middle of our conversation. I was unable to reach him again until very late the next day. He said he went to sleep. <laughs> right. He returns and one day a call comes through and it's another ex. I ask him why she's still calling him and leaving messages that sound like he's her man. He explained it away saying, oh, she's just a psychopath nympho. I've told her to leave me alone and that we are done, and I've moved on, but she won't stop calling. So I go into, let's put an end to the nonsense mode and tell him to call her right then and there in front of me and tell her what he just told me. He obliged and I let the incident go after he made the call, left her a voicemail and I physically saw him do it with my own eyes. By this time, I have my radar up looking for any more signs of betrayal. He doesn't take long to provide me with some more foolishness. I find a woman's umbrella in the back seat of my car. He one day comes in and tells me he's joining the gym near his job so he can work out after work, even though I love to work out and they have the same gym near where we live. My suspicion grows. And then I go onto my computer that he would often use and find all kinds of history of visits to porno sites. Apparently, he's been visiting those after I'd gone to bed at night instead of coming to bed with me. But I'm willing to just let it go, too, because we are still doing great in the bedroom, and he says he's very happy. So, no cause for alarm, right? Mm-mm. Wrong. I decide to check on who is riding around in my car, leaving umbrellas behind. A car that I bought, since his credit was bad. Just so that he would have a way to get to and from work, being that he lived in the suburbs with limited transportation. We split the car payments, and it was primarily just for his use, and I had to put the car payment down on it. So, I plan to record her in the car, and am not very surprised at this point to hear he has become quite chummy with some woman at work, and not only was he buying her lunch every day, but she's the reason he was so eager to get a gym membership near his job to work out after work. By now, it's all becoming very clear that this guy, who had proposed marriage at the time, he decided to move in was cheating on me. I confronted him. He denied it and told me, I love you. I don't want anyone else. I'm not trying to get with anyone else. Stop being so insecure. He even went so far as to suggest I need to go get help. Since I still loved him and really couldn't believe what I was seeing or wasn't ready to, I quieted down and started to look at myself to see how I was creating the situation that he claimed was just my insecurities. I had booked flights, a hotel, and bought tickets for a concert a few months prior to the very first incident of betrayal, and they were non-refundable. It was supposed to be in celebration of my birthday weekend. He said he didn't want to go. I said fine and I was not going to go unless he came too. Saturday morning rolls around, and it's time to leave for the flight. He asked me why I'm not going, and I let him know that if he's not coming, I'm not going. A few hours pass as I guess he was hoping I'd change my mind and just go. He then says, no sense in wasting the money, let's go. He runs out briefly, returns with a gift bag and birthday card, and hands it to me with a kiss. I now look back on that kiss as the kiss of Judas. So, I accept the gift, 
We pack and off we go to our trip. We have a wonderful time and there is no sign of anything being amiss until day three, my birthday morning. He jumps up out of a warm, cozy bed with me, claiming he is going to get us some coffee. My radar immediately goes up, but I play it cool, not trying to start any trouble. I only wish that was all he went to do. Turns out this cheating man was only jumping up and left out so that he can make a phone call to the woman at his job to let her know he'll be back to work the next day because I decided to go on the trip with her since she wouldn't leave. I won't say how I heard this conversation, but I'll leave it to your imagination. Luckily, I didn't hear this until after he returned, or he might still be on that trip. So, one and one is now beginning to equal three, and I now see he's definitely not a man of honesty, nor integrity, and is at this point just playing me for a fool. If you haven't guessed by now, the plan for me was to leave on the trip by myself so that while I was gone, he could bring this woman from work into our bedroom to do what grown folks do. So, I'll bring this foolish union to a final end with the grand finale. A few days after we got back from that birthday trip, he's at work and calls me to say he left his phone home. My radar goes back up. As since I'd known him, he never leaves his phone at home. I also made note that the night before, he'd made it a point to tell me three times that he was going to be getting off work late at six. Uh-huh. So, after the call, I decided something's up, and I'm going to finally get to the bottom of it all. I leave work, which for me is 65 miles away from where he works, and go rent a car. It just so happens all they have left is a sleek BMW 6 with tenant windows. To say that I was happy to have lucked out with that car would be a gross understatement. So I'm driving down the turnpike, going a little over the speed limit, feeling like I can't get to his job quick enough. The hour's ride gives me time to gather my thoughts and devise a plan. I arrive at his job at around 3 p.m. and see no sign of our car that is really my car in the parking lot. I dial his work line and the receptionist is nice enough to inform me that not only is he not there, but he's left for the day and won't be back. Now, didn't he say he was leaving at 6 p.m. three times? So... I GPS our car, and it shows me that he's at the gym. I'll let you all guess which one. <laughs> so I ride over to the gym, and voila, there's our car. So three hours pass, and I patiently wait to see who emerges, when, and with who. He makes sure not to disappoint me as he comes out of the gym holding hands, looking like he doesn't have a care in the world with a woman from his job. I decide to ride by them, both as she and him are preparing to get in our car to go for a little ride. I make sure to roll down the windows, but amazingly, neither one of them notices me. By this time, I am quite heated and ready to pounce, expose, and cause a scene, but something tells me to follow the married woman with a child and my fiancé to see what will happen next. So, I literally ride right behind them, almost tailgating them through the neighborhood until they finally come to a stop and park in a small parking lot of a community development. I park three cars down and wait to see what's next. After a good while, neither of them emerge from the car. So I pull out, move the tenant window BMW right next to our car. The new Love Mobile. I peer over and see what looks like a man. Yes, my man and this woman getting quite busy, kissing, squeezing, hugging, and 
Let's just say they are getting it all in. Wowza. A big lump begins to form in my throat and my eyes tear up as I walk closer and closer to the car, our car, and get the full and nasty picture. I stand there for what seems like two decades trying to figure out what to do, how to deal, and wipe my eyes thinking this must be a dream. Please let me sit down. This is making me sick. In the words of Ricky Ricardo, after several minutes, still unnoticed by either of them, I go back to the BMW, reach in my purse, grab my set of keys to our car, walk back over to the driver's side window, where my fiancé is bent over giving her a hickey, and press the keypad to open the driver's side door. I yank the door open to a full display of my fiancé and the woman doing their thing, and from the bottom of my gut, scream roar out like a wounded lion. Are you two having a fucking good time? They are startled and disturbed enough to immediately stop what they are doing as they both turn to stare at me, the intruder both looking idiotically, dumbfounded, and dazed like two deer in headlights with their fur down. I fade to black, literally, as the truth is revealed about the man I trusted, believed in, and was so foolishly thinking of spending the rest of my life with. And that is the story of the craziest thing an ex has ever done to me. All right, folks, buckle up. This is one hell of a story. My ex-fiance cheated on me right after we got soft engaged. I was still slowly moving in with him from another state. He slept with the same girl he randomly met online five times in the span of the month that I was traveling back and forth every few weeks. Once my life was in danger while driving late at night, and I called him dozens of times for help. And I ultimately didn't hear from him until 10 a.m. the next morning. He was with her and had his phone hidden. Fast forward to our real engagement. We flew to Arizona, and after he got my father's permission, we spent sunrise in the Mesa Desert, exchanging gold bands surrounded by gorgeous cacti. We took a ton of artistic photos. I'm a model and he is a photographer. It's how we originally met in November of 2017. I should have known by our complete lack of loving emotional exchange during the whole engagement that this relationship was doomed. Again, more on that later. Back at my dad's that afternoon, he randomly asked me for my phone to block his ex-wife, who was a narcissist and was apparently nagging him about being in a trip with me instead of having his son for the weekend. He gives me my phone back and I think nothing of it. A day later, we get home. So the day after, we became in an official domestic partnership engagement. He is back at work since he owns his own business. I'm unpacking when I get a DM request on Instagram. It looks like one of those second accounts for ugly selfies or memes or whatever, but I accept the message out of curiosity. It's a girl telling me she's so sorry, but she just put the pieces together that he and I had been together engaged when they slept together. She was honest, gentle, so sorrowful, and wonderfully kind about it. I was just thankful to find out and it not be this big secret that I would have ever found out about. He's a gifted pathological liar. I still didn't believe her at first and asked for any proof. Five times in a month? He's not even a sexual person at all and was still sleeping with me when I was in town? Ah... Uh, I didn't believe it. 
Remember, I was moving my stuff in slowly, so I know I would be able to immediately tell by what belongings were in the background, what weeks I was out of town. She was right and provided me everything I had asked for. Screenshots, the time and date stamps, photos, and even a graphic XXX video of them he took, proving she was in his, our home a week earlier. Yes, you heard that correctly. He slept with her a day before I arrived to fly out for our engagement. I don't blame her at all, and I was just so thankful to find out. I'm a really forgiving person and have previously been in polyamorous relationships. This was not one, so I get it more than most people would. He got home and I confronted him by putting my phone up to his face, showing the sex between them on that night I was in danger, and he dismissed it, holding up his left hand and letting his sparkling gold engagement ban speak for him, I guess, denying it and had to rush back to work. I call him after the girl sends me the nail in the coffin proof I know he couldn't deny. He snapped, fine, and angrily admitted he had cheated on me. I said, okay, and we'd talk about it when he got home. The girl and I ended up texting for a while as I went through all of our stuff. I could tell she was going to be an important person in my life. I found things in my search that proved there was more random truths he was withholding. Three hours later, I sat across the table from him and said, you get one chance to be completely honest with me and everything and anything. Is there anything else I need to know? He said no. Stone cold and unapologetic. A reply that had ruined his life before the conversation and is currently haunting him every single day as he willingly signed over custody of his child because his ex-wife wasn't comfortable with him being in a relationship with me, something he didn't bother to even tell me. I would have never allowed our relationship to continue if it was me versus his kid. Fast forward and I ended up staying with this guy for eight months. He's an Air Force veteran with severe PTSD and alcoholism. I'm a helper and I see past more than I should. I enabled him constantly, buying him whatever he wanted and funding his habits while I got next to nothing in return, but fights or silence. I was physically harmed a few times and after his troubled mental blackout spell in the middle of the night, I ran to protect myself. This was a mere six days after I finally settled in with him. Ten days after our engagement. The girl and I had stayed friends. I told him that same night I found out he cheated and that she and I were definitely brought into each other's lives for a reason. He was awkward but knew he wasn't in a position to protest. He always called it weird, but many girls reading this know that a sister who tells you your boo is cheating on you, even with her, is the realest person you'll ever meet. This girl has been there for me off and on during the past eight months, especially as she's also in the military and has people around her dealing with PTSD and addiction. Christmas 2020 which I spent with my family back home. He was here alone, working, and didn't even get to see his kid. My ex and I decided to break up. It was the holiday season and a small business, so he was so busy and treating me badly all the time. I slept with one of my best guy friends during my own bad mental health breakdown. This was our fourth and last attempt at a breakup. He manipulated me into telling him I slept with someone, even though it didn't matter, as we were broken up. 
had a PTSD blackout spell and threatened to harm me unless I moved the rest of my shit to my dorm immediately. I somehow did it. Kept him calm, got some hands to help me with my books and clothes and random stuff remaining from the first time I moved out. I even bought him alcohol and made him pizza before I finally left since I knew he'd need it. Everyone in my life hates him and knows most of the drama. I'm Italian, come on now. But I kept staying because I know so much of his struggles. The bad decision making and the way he treats me are because of all of his pain. We were also soft engaged in 2018 and broke up the exact same time of year as now. Maybe the stars are cursed. The person he is behind all that trauma and self-medicating is my soulmate and letting that go isn't easy. He's decided to get sober again a week ago. Third time's a charm. Which happened to be before Valentine's Day, which he gives me the best gift ever and doesn't speak to me for 36 hours. Up until this point, we still would text all day, every day, and haven't seen each other in weeks. He broke his silence, saying a tax form had arrived for me. The last thing he said before that, fuck you both, me and the girl, even though it's been seven months since he even spoke to her. I was doing a Valentine's Day wholesome photo shoot with a trusted friend, and the girl was a part of the shoot. She did the concept planning with a classmate and I, did our makeup, and was encouraged to model for the first time with me. It was so fun, and... They are some of my favorite pictures in a decade of my art career. Two weeks have gone by since his second attempt at sobriety and his brutal disdain and anger at me is somehow the fault of some heart-shaped stickers stuck to the faces of two girls, one he loved and both he hurt. The photos and our friendship is still triggering his shame root issues, I guess, and he's playing the addict's favorite guilt blame shame game to me. Nonetheless, I'm much healthier than I've ever been, and the space away from him, as he's going through withdrawal, has helped me see more clearly than I want to. I am somehow healthy, my full of space and self-love. I'm Setting strong boundaries, but I really am the only person in his life left. It's just really tough to be there for him when all he does is spew toxic words at me. So, I hope he really does get sober and wakes up and realize how good of a person he is and how many people he's lost in his life. Firstly, a little background about the relationship. It was not a happy one. When it began, he was the perfect guy, very nice and polite. Though there were a few red flags, I had ignored them as I was a silly 19-year-old falling in love for the first time. Gradually, he turned verbally abusive he would imagine situations that never happened and then call me names for being disloyal in these situations. For example, once he said that he had come to my college on a holiday and some girls of my class, no girls of my class even knew what he looked like, told him I was too promiscuous. After a few days of this verbal abuse, there would be a honeymoon period when everything would be nice and perfect. Again, after a few months, the abuses would start. Gradually, this time, interval between abusive periods began to reduce. He had alienated me from my friends, and I used to think I had nobody but him. Finally, I grew tired of tolerating this abuse silently and told everything to one of his close friends. 
He used to respect this friend and often look to his advice. However, this backfired and he started calling my close friends and said nasty, untruthful things as revenge. He also completely stopped treating me like a person and used nasty words every time he talked to me. By this time, I was so terrified of him. He had seized my phone multiple times and he had the phone numbers of my parents. Being from a conservative family, my parents would be very disappointed in me if they ever come to know about this relationship. I could not bear to do that to my aged father. I was scared that if I left him, he would call my parents and tell them these awful things about me. Finally, one day, completely out of the blue, he called me and said he wanted to break up. He said he had found another girlfriend and wanted nothing to do with me. The two years of abuse had finally come to an end. What a relief it was. But my happiness was short-lived. A few days after the breakup, he started blackmailing me for no good reason. He told me to send nude photos of myself and threatened to tell my parents about the relationship if I didn't. Thus began the most horrible time of my life. I was terrified of my phone. Every day he had a new demand and new threats. He called this guy of my class and told him we had sex. People spread rumors about me in college. Once, when I was at a friend's flat working on our final year project, he called me some 30 to 40 times. I told him I was at somebody else's house and couldn't talk. He ordered me to leave the house immediately. When I stopped picking up, he found the phone number of the other guy in my project by calling up some other people and called him instead. He even found somebody working in the same company as my older brother and used that person to get my brother's phone number. Most people advised me to confess everything to my family, but they didn't understand my family's situation. They wouldn't understand. I would have lost my independence and they would have never trusted me ever again. Nothing is important to me. Meanwhile, he asked me to meet him one evening. I was too scared to refuse. He took me to a dark alley and forcibly groped me. I tried to fight, but he was too strong. I ran away, and he followed. I was too embarrassed to create a scene and quietly went home. I decided never to meet him again, come hell or high water. I blocked him everywhere and there was some peace for about four months. Now he has started calling every weekend. He keeps calling and texting from different numbers until I pick up. His calls alternate between threats and begs. One minute, he promises to take revenge for leaving him, and the next he promises to mend his ways and begs me to meet him again. I have cried, begged, screamed, and repeated the words, stop calling me, about a hundred times, if not more. But he doesn't stop. Every week comes to a point when he says he won't disturb me again, and he calls me again the following week. Today, he called and asked me to marry him. Since I just passed college, he is willing to wait for three to four years, and if I am still not married to him, he vowed to kidnap me. I do not know where this will go. I am hoping he will stop once he realizes there is no future. Or maybe I am being just as naive as I was three years ago. Okay, so let me start off by saying what happened when we broke up. I was at his house, and I was supposed to be picked up within the next 10 minutes by my dad. I did not have a car at the time. I timed the whole thing so I can tell him and get out of there as soon as possible. 
Well, my dad was running late and picked me up 30 minutes late. So, I told my ex that I wanted to break up with him. He asked me why, and I told him how I could no longer deal with his anger issues and the games he played. He would not accept the breakup and said he will only be going on break and that the break would not last more than three months. I agreed just so he can take the breakup somehow. He then started banging his head against the wall, calling himself an idiot. We sat in silence for about 30 minutes before my dad finally came and picked me up. A few months later, he kept asking me out on dates and trying to give me presents. For the most part, I would refuse, and then I did go see him. I would make sure one of our other friends were with us. Fast forward about five months. I am a freshman in college, and my ex is repeating his senior year. He was part of our friend group, still, but we hardly talked. An anime convention was just around the corner, and we were all planning for that. My ex, some high school friends, and a few friends from college, and I all go to this convention. The thing I noticed right away was that my ex was being really nasty and mean to all the guys, even to our friends that I met through him. He would start cheating at games, and when we called him out on it, he just threw a tantrum. The convention ends, and he messages our group chat. He said he will no longer go to these conventions because he spent over $500 on things. He then left the group chat. His loss, not mine. He never finished high school as well. He stopped talking to most of us. I do see him at the next convention, and he has seemed to let himself go a little bit. He also bought a hat that said Hente on it and started to wear it everywhere. I avoid going downtown because that is where he lives and works. Also, I hate driving downtown with all the curvy one-way streets. I did see him once in my neighborhood when I was driving home from work, which was a surprise. He really let himself go. He kind of already had that pedo look about him, but he seemed to just fully embrace the look. Not saying he's a pedo and that pedos only look like that, but he looks like the stereotypical pedophile with the white van that you see on TV. Some people say I should just have run him over after how he treated me in our relationship and afterwards. I keep in touch with some of his best friends than what he does. Heck, even tonight, when I'm writing this, I am going to hang out with a few of them and get pizza. I have no clue what my ex is doing. But, to be honest, I really do not care. After the way he treated me in our relationship, a story for another time, and how he treated our friends, I want him out of my life. I don't want him dead, but I don't need him in my life. Our relationships is one of the biggest things I regret, and the less I see of him, the better. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true crazy exes. Before I go on any further, I would like to take a moment and acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Anita V, Donna, Lus Crispin, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S, Tina Mee, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, and Haunted. Thank you all again and so, so much for being the pillars that holds this channel up. I am forever indebted to you. Thank you. For all the other subscribers or maybe first time listeners or just people that, you know, peek by just to hear what the channel is about. Thank you so much for your support. For without you, I wouldn't have a voice and there would never be a Back to Ashes channel. 
If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.